Thank you, Aaron. Very flattering words. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me to, uh, to your school. Great to uh, be here. Um, next time, I hope this will be a live uh, connection that we can, can build. Um, yeah, uh, I think you made a very, very great introduction. And um, I will uh, start off with my presentation, also telling a little, little bit and explaining about uh, some of the notions you have already mentioned. Um, introducing my uh, team first of uh, people that we are uh, based uh, with in Rotterdam. And um, actually, we are based in a, in a great new project. I mean, this uh, we bought already five years ago. It's not that new anymore, but it's a, a large venue in Rotterdam at the Maas River, at a fantastic spot, derelict, that uh, together with the impact investor we bought and transformed into uh, the circular hub for at least Rotterdam, and I believe as well in, uh, uh, for Europe. I will tell. I didn't, quite I didn't realize that. That's a fantastic venue. Sorry, I had to interrupt. It's an amazing, amazing place. I will come back to it in a little bit later, because it also is a is a great experiment on many different levels that we're we're undertaking here. Um, I started uh, 2012 Architects uh, with, uh, with uh, César Peren, um, and César actually in 2016 branched off uh, being his own uh, superuse on-site, uh, which actually uh, collaborates on on-site projects with communities um, that uh, try to yeah, create self-sufficient housing. And um, actually, um, uh, also uh, thanks to Aaron when he invited us to uh, ex exhibit our work in at the Shenzhen Biennale in uh, 2016, um, we also started uh, Superuse China, and three partners are running the studio from Beijing there. I, I divided this lecture in two parts. Uh, one is about the circular design and architecture which is close to the profession of the architect that I was indeed trained in. And the second part is uh, building uh, cyclifiers, which actually um, yeah, connects many different layers and flows that surround us and that we are not often noticing as architecture, at least not when I was trained as an architect. Luckily, this is changing. And in order to give you a little bit of an idea of what my view on the world is uh, based on, um, I give you two graphs that on the left side show you the, um, yeah, actually the enormous amounts uh, of extraction that we uh, take from this world and uh, actually that's not able to uh, replenish in time. So this shows a graph of the Earth overshoot day that uh, was around uh, Ju July 29th, 2019. So that's actually when we have already consumed uh, the, uh, the stock of the, the earth of the year. So on the one hand, we are uh, extracting too much. And on the other hand, on the right side, you see the enormous amount of value, even economically, of all the um, resources we are actually not using after extracting them. So that's the waste that is occurring. And these two uh, glasses are how uh, Superuse is looking at the world and trying to create new value uh, within these two uh, extremes. One of the um, yeah, new um, objects that we saw as one of the sources for our work was the renewable energy. Uh, we very much appreciate and like the uh, more locally um, harvested energy that doesn't pollute that much, uh, doesn't create uh, oil stains, etc. cetera. Um, but actually, when we started researching this, we found out that the way this is made is actually pretty energy and labor intensive. So the, these huge blades that are um, yeah, harvesting the energy are produced in large wharfs, um, a lot of manual labor, actually. It's like a shipbuilding um, and uh, creates uh, energy. But after 10, 15 years, these blades are uh, taken from uh, the wind, uh, wind uh, turbines 
and um, are wasted. In the Netherlands uh, and in Europe, most of them are burned because of the lack of space we have. But uh, as we also learned from uh, this photo is that in the US at the moment, they are actually uh, burying uh, these in large graveyards. And it's a kind of stack of all kinds of different components. The layer behind below this is uh, car tires, uh, but the new waste flow is uh, our green energy supply. So we see this, um, of course, as something we do not like, but we also see this as an opportunity to create our new designs because um, we see the aesthetics of these components. And when we got the commission to design the playground, we started investigating if we could actually turn these blades into new functions because uh, currently they're just cut and uh, burnt. The first experiment that we did is the, the Wikado playground this is in Rotterdam. We bought or actually got uh, five of these windmill blades because they're waste. So we only need to buy or uh, uh, pay for the transportation. Um, and transformed them in uh, yeah five different types of functions for a playground the drill a couple of holes in them so you can play hide and seek and um, by putting them on different levels you create all kind of different functions for them so you can sit on them uh, sit at them eat um, hide uh, because playing hide and seek i mean that's what the playground is about and it also creates uh, yeah, exciting spaces that uh, we see we get for free. This is not a space that we uh, design, but it's actually by the, uh, the industrial design that, this, um, that these blades have been made by uh, create these uh, blobby atmospheres. And by building them, we also save uh, CO2 emissions. We compare this to other uh, playgrounds and find that um, we are uh, like have a 10% CO2 emission compared to the traditional traditional standard playground. Also good to note is that uh, we also reused all the um, elements that we could still give another lifespan. So the stainless steel slides uh bricks that were on the site we uh, duck them and uh, transformed them uh, to give them an hour function there's a lot of uh, different opportunities for these blades so um we also challenge uh, students to to design with them um, but for the city of rotterdam um, we had to become the, the contractor because uh, there was no contractor that uh, dared to build it so we also were the contractor for this urban furniture, um, slightly smaller uh, windmill blades. And the nice thing about it is that by the because of the different shape they have, um, every person uh, with different posture can actually find his own or her own uh, specific spot where you are most comfortable. So uh, different than making a um, kind of a unity, we create a diversity in uh, the use of the blades. And um, this also um, um, gave us the idea that when the municipality of Rotterdam, after 10 years, wanted to take the furniture away to uh, turn it into uh, a monument, actually, they wanted to have a monument for diversity on this site, we pro proposed, well, why don't we hire an artist, uh, give it a new uh, coloring scheme, um, cleaned up and um, reposition it. So uh, this is what happened. So this uh, furniture also got its third life. The concrete blocks by then were the first ones that were actually um, made with 100% Rotterdam uh, demolishing rubble. Now, by now, uh, much higher level sustainable concrete is possible, but uh, this was at that time a uh, pretty uh, high level. Well, like I said, a lot of different uh, possibilities are, uh, uh, yeah, are available to us to design them. So we're actually currently developing a whole, um, yeah, a whole set of furniture urban functions um, that you can design with these windmill blades and because the amounts are endless and growing uh, 
uh, every year. Um, we're also uh, branching out to other uh, countries and uh, currently looking for opportunities to build uh, similar furniture and urban interventions in the US. Well, in, with this way of working, we, um, as trained as an architect, we were, uh, of course, trained in looking at the standard catalogs of materials. So the conventional material uh, was all known to us, and it's easy as an architect to design with it. The recycled uh, components also were coming up, uh, bio-based material also, yeah, catalogs are available. But when we wanted to reuse our components, um, either by using them directly or to transform them a little bit into uh, new functions, uh, we actually didn't have any resources. So every time it costed us a lot of energy to find our resources for projects that we wanted to launch, because we also want these resources to be as local as possible to limit uh, the transport. Um, so um, in already in 2004, even before Google Maps existed, we uh, built our first um, online platform to both showcase uh, super use examples from around the globe, but also be able to find uh, materials that uh, were available. And we made even a kind of a um, yeah, selector for different types of functions in colors and hardness and uh, water resistance, etc. So you could actually select your typical uh, material that you could upcycle. Um, it was a little bit too early for the technology available then, so we decided to uh, build separate parts of it, of this integrated tool into uh, new ones. And uh, like Aaron already mentioned, the, the Harvest Map was uh, born. Uh, finally, in 2012, we launched the first version of, uh, of Harvest Map, which actually uh, was the collection of the uh, first 15 years of uh, sources that we had found uh, in our uh, projects. And then, um, that's how we operate, that whenever we understand that we need a tool in order to operate like we want, we try to find um, budgets to also make this uh, available open source. Well, the Harvest Map had a collection, like I said, of uh, like um, um, all kind of new um, supply that was uh, uh, given to us. And of course, the standard supply that we already knew. Um, like, for instance, uh, cable reels, they're um, after five years uh, available in different uh, cities uh, after the cables uh, are taken off. And um, this also led to the first uh, super use uh, villa that we designed in Enschede, which was um, uh, the first house that we uh, completed uh, with more than 60% of reclaimed materials. So um, a luxurious villa made out of waste. This was in 2009 when we uh, were completing it. And um, because it was a textile industry environment, we also found a textile machine that supplied the steel structure. 90% of uh, all the steel uh, structure has been built out of these uh, components of a textile production machine. And um, also this led to a reduction of CO2 emissions of uh, 90%. Um, also, we had uh, the wood used uh, that was slightly less uh, effective because we had to transport it in order to, uh, to treat it in a good and non-chemical way. But the transport made it um, less, uh, less uh, ecologically efficient. Another material we use more on the on the interior. I mean, it's not just the the, the building, but as well the whole interior. Um, like uh, more than half of all the materials have been reclaimed. Um, a, a very nice factory from England. Actually, it was an old steel factory that uh, became derelict, which has been readopted uh, into a small plastics factory, and they collect all types of different uh, plastic waste and turn them into. Yeah, this almost natural stone-like uh, uh, plastic material that we used for uh, the, the bathrooms. 
by now the house is around 12 years old and it still uh, functions in a very good way we actually did not know how long the wood would last so um, because the material was for free we um, took uh, two cubic meters of wood um, yeah on a surplus so we could store that in the house uh, that whenever they would need um, yeah, part of the facade to be renovated, they could uh, use that supply. So far, I think only one square meter has uh, been replaced uh, with, the, with the wood, especially on the horizontal parts. That's, uh, that's a little bit harder to uh, be made out of wood in this case. A very recent project is in Eindhoven, um, also industrial, formerly uh, heavily industrial uh, environment um, where we designed a more public space for a cultural organization uh, which has yeah has uh, like 80 percent of reclaimed material so we are actually every project we're doing we are uh, putting uh, the are actually the challenge a little bit higher um, it's based in the older uh, historical environment um, in Eindhoven where uh, this monumental school uh, that already had the program of uh, yeah the kind of creative program needed an extension so we designed um, this extension for them which also allows them to have a little bit more um, yeah express what their activities and um, not just we, uh, that we built a digital harvest map actually for each project that we are creating we also uh, create uh, a, yeah the paper harvest map uh, or a digital one that we can share with the client also to decide which materials we're going to use and when we complete the project we can show the uh, yeah where the resources ever uh, originated from which also allows us to calculate the distance and the co2 uh, emissions that come with them for this project, um, the, the chicken barn that was being taken apart was uh, the main ingredient that shaped this project. So we had kind of a basic shape for in our sketch design, but by uh, taking these old beams and reconfiguring them, uh, we created um, a great um, open space for uh, for this organization. And uh, since we also are thinking about what happens if they want to transform this building in 20, 30, uh, 50 years, all the components have been bolted together. So um, they can be easily dismantled and um, used again for a future project. In this project, uh, like I said, just the glass of the facade and the roofing, um, yeah, the, the water barrier um, have been uh, um, yeah bought new including the heating installation and uh, all the other parts have been reclaimed from other projects up to the foundation uh, which is uh, built out of the concrete slabs that uh, yeah traditionally come with uh, temporary pavement for instance larger temporary pavement um, so even the the foundation can be uh, taken apart and uh, re-adapted or uh, reused in the future and then of course uh, the client also um, was inspired and started buying uh, parts and furniture from uh, online marketplaces uh, and furnished their whole space with it Um, when the project was completed, some smaller parts of the uh, yeah the, the construction, the wooden construction, uh, were not used. So we could also include them in uh, the furniture, uh, which you see in front. So there are the cutting remains from the construction. Um, these are uh, relatively small scale projects, but uh, by now we're also scaling up in the size of uh, buildings and the type of clients. So the, the Dutch National Real Estate Agency hired us for a series of buildings that are transform, uh, transformed on our former airfield. Um, it's turned into a, a hub for uh, innovative companies and um, asked us to transform, uh, for instance, uh, this former 
uh, storage and uh, yeah storage building. Um, for this building, we used materials that uh, architects tend to hate, uh, the plastic uh, window frames uh, that um, spoil a lot of the monuments in the Netherlands, but actually we think they are and materials and components can't be ugly. It's how you position them and the context you put them in. So by um, collecting them, um, cleaning them, and actually refurbishing them, we create completely new open facades um, with reclaimed components. Um, in this case, also the whole energy supply has been a very uh, sustainable one. These are um, yeah, vertical energy uh, generators and, and the energy is stored into salt batteries. So also the, the battery pack is, uh, is a low impact one and uh, functions very well. It, it supplies the energy for 90% uh, of the use of this building. And here you see like the, the, the former uh, traditional housing facades being turned into, um, yeah, into a functional uh, um, light space in this building. Well, I mentioned harvest map. Um, so this uh, both uh, gives us materials that we can use for our projects, but also helps us consulting others. That's actually a kind of a new uh, additional activity that we started to do, where um, the materials that we know are available to us in larger quantities and in a more continuous way, uh, we collect them and um, yeah, this show them in these showcases. So we have a collection of all kinds of materials around uh, 50 that we can uh, supply to other architects and we consult them on their on the application. For instance, the wood I showed on the facade of uh, the villa uh, from the cable reels, you see them here. They're, uh, yeah, they have this uh, interesting curve that gives a special expression to, uh, to whatever you build with it. But as well, one of our favorite materials for the moment is uh, the remains of steel industry. I think as well in the US, there's a, of course a large steel industry. Um, not many people know that um, around 10 to 15 percent of all the uh, steel that is uh, turned into uh, components and parts for uh, other for other industries actually is wasted and um, okay afterwards recycled but the, on a uh, low level and including a lot of uh, transport um, after lasing cutting components uh, or plasma cutting components these kind of sheets uh, remain there uh, always like one and a half by three meter size and um, yeah what they are uh, what is uh, they are collected by a waste collector um, it's uh, transported to another country then molten into steel and uh, turned into maybe a fence later on um, we think this is a beautiful material so why first uh, do all this logistics and uh, all putting all the energy uh, to melt it and uh, turn it into a new material while you can actually immediately use it on a local base and interesting enough we can even offer the company that has this supply of waste double the steel price compared to what he is getting uh, when it's um, uh, when it's wasted so the villa, uh, for instance, in Enschede, uh, they liked uh, a small fence uh, to get a little bit of privacy on the terrace. So this was one of the first experiments where we used this material. Uh, but also um, uh, over Trainers Way and uh, SLA architects, um, we supplied them with the material for uh, a cladding of a building. And um, here we uh, completely get into our new role and uh, next to of course being an architect we also consult other architects in this case uh, Wessel van Geffen architects um, together with them we want a bit to design and build uh, a waste collection center it's in the middle of the Hague um, in uh, close by Rotterdam um, and interesting enough here the bit that had the highest amount of um, components and materials that otherwise would be 
uh, recycled or uh, degraded or uh, dumped or burned um, uh, would win uh, this uh, competition. So uh, we got to a level of uh, over 60% here and won that bit. Um, we have around 1500 square meters of this uh, uh, materials I just showed uh, uh, used as cladding next to um, yeah, um, climatic facade that also has been reclaimed from other buildings. Even the contractor started understanding this, so he was dismantling uh, a wooden fence, uh, like a fencing for waters uh, or for canals somewhere and uh, included this in the project for uh, carrying the facade. Interesting enough here, the whole program also starts to, uh, yeah, to uh, become interesting because this is actually a center where people uh, bring their waste uh, from their gardens or the construction waste, the, like individuals and or in households. And um, after this, it's sorted and then uh, recycled. Unfortunately, not yet on a high level that you can actually access the materials people are bringing here. So it, uh, there still is this intermediary uh, in between. We really don't understand why uh, you would first recycle and melt this material. Actually, um, what I said, like the, the supplier of the material gets more, the waste um, logistics company also can uh, send another invoice because uh, he uh, is not longer a waste collector, but he's uh, logistics in the building industry. Um, we earn a little bit on the uh, trade uh, between uh, the supplier and the, and the project. And the client has a material that is like 20, 25% cheaper than if you would buy something like this new. So actually with the tons of materials that are being transported around the globe already, it's possible to create added value also economically and of course uh, ecologically um, without too many people knowing. Again, we made a harvest map um, showing the resources of this um, this waste collection center. I can understand maybe um, because this is the first part, which is still very close to the architectural uh, profession. I maybe there are some questions in between that um, some urgent questions that someone would like to ask. I can uh, already respond to. If there are any hands or Someone in the chat. Uh, one of my friends had to leave for a class, but he had a question about the glass. Um, you mentioned that the glass that you use isn't uh, upcycled, but is there a way that you're looking at upcycling glass or something like that? Um, well, sometimes it's like for uh, interior use, uh, it's possible to have uh, exterior use glass that you start to use um, yeah, for uh, space separation, etc. But uh, like the, the regulations for energy efficiency, of course, are raising, uh, rising. So it's hard to have the same, uh, yeah, to, to get to the right specifications. Of course, also we want the energy performance of our buildings to be uh, good as well. So. Some other uh, options are actually having multiple layers of um, window frames and glass uh, without having to recycle it. But um, for, especially with uh, insulated glass, um, you want to have a, a lifespan that you can predict. So there we are still bound to uh, most often using new uh, glass in this way. But it's a good, uh, good point. We we are waiting for the, the like upcycling uh, glass concepts that are. Okay, I'll shift to to the second part, which is uh, about cyclifiers, and that's actually 
um, the part where we're not just looking at a classical commission for an architect, like a client has his program, he requests the architect to design the most efficient space, but we're also both initiating and uh, supporting uh, projects where we're uh, both designing the space and the processes that are taking place. And Cyclifier uh, is the name that we gave to such a, a program in a city where waste flows of resources are actually upcycled uh, in a space that of course is built with upcycled materials as well. Um, this is kind of the, the, the yeah, showing the traditional pro, uh, processes of a linear uh, process where materials are turned into products and waste, uh, sometimes 90% uh, waste and only 10% of products. Um, so we look at which waste flows can we actually, um, yeah, uh, upcycle, uh, turn them into products or half products that can uh, either be sold in the same uh, place or used in the same process or sold to other clients to uh, be used there. And this also makes us look at uh, different types of flows, um, not just uh, material, uh, often inorganic and organic material, but also at the logistics, uh, energy, money flows, uh, user flows, water and liquids. Uh, well, uh, many different flows that you could actually look at. We, we look um uh, have like 14 different ones that uh, we distinguish and the, the biggest uh, project so far and the, the most uh, integrated uh, effort we're undertaking is, is blue city our also our rotterdam uh, home base um which is really uh, initiated as a um, yeah, as an ecosystem for companies but also as a symbiotic city it's not uh, yeah it's uh, we uh, uh, didn't choose our name Blue City by occasion, but uh, we really want this to be an active city with many different functions, different resource needs, uh, different productions, uh, different activities going on 24 hour. Um, so in uh, 2015, we found an investor that uh, bought this building uh, aimed at turning it into a, a hub for the circular economy. And it now houses around 40 different enterprises, some small ones, some uh, bigger ones that all are working at developing products for, uh, uh, yeah, on the basis of upcycling. Um, it used to be a, a tropical swimming pool, one of the first ones in Europe. Uh, so people from Belgium and Germany came to visit it. It um, was active for around 20 years and then became derelict because of uh, uh, neglect um, and so which uh, this allowed us to uh, buy this building for a relatively affordable price on a top location in Rotterdam of course and as an architect we um, started actually digging into this building uh, like the uh, turning uh, creating new pathways to have uh, more public access to um the yeah the technical spaces in the basement for instance of this uh, but also transforming uh, the former discotheque into uh, office space <coughs> and the idea uh, of the metabolism we're developing is that uh, by time we're intensifying the use of the building in the beginning just a couple of companies uh, using not too ma many resources yet but still most of it uh, sourced outside, um, um, but also uh, wasting still a little bit of energy because of lack of insulation. But actually by adding more companies using each other's energy sources um, or wastes, um, we can actually optimize this building. And we also believe that in the end we can create a very high density of use. Of course, uh, 2020 is not uh, when we are com have been completely occupied, but we're now seeing the stage where I think in like three years, uh, we're coming to um, um, yeah very optimal occupancy of this building. To, in order to generate uh, income for, uh, for Blue City, we started with the offices that we actually built from uh, wasted window frames from a courthouse. Uh, we got 200 similar ones. Um, here we could uh, reuse the, the glass as well for a big part. 
um, and created uh, many different separate spaces. And actually, uh, this is how we design the, the material that is supplied to us also starts to define the, uh, the space and the environment. So the design is following uh, the components. Uh, in this case, uh, this also helped us in um, having a better acoustics in the building and um, also by because of the reflection, uh, even though it is completely transparent, people do not feel like sitting in a fishbowl. Uh, we also made a map here where everything was retrieved. Um, and um, like I said, this is not just a circular built redevelopment of the, and refurbishment of a former building, but also it houses all kinds of companies, very interesting ones like Fruit Ladder that turns uh, mango uh, waste into a ladder competitor, um, a company that turns uh, algae into building material and uh, our neighbors um, at the Future Factory that have a waste plastic company, a little bit like what I showed uh, in Villa Velpelo, um, but they are doing this in, uh, in tiles for uh, bathrooms. Uh, next to that, there is a collective function, uh, a uh, laboratory where the different entrepreneurs in this building can actually experiment and do ki all kinds of mock-ups and biological experiments on the, the resources that are currently wasted. And again, as well, this lab is uh, completely built in a circular way. Um, so that's uh, 12 and a half thousand square meters. Uh, the very small one that we're currently working on is for the market in Rotterdam that has a lot of residual waste after the market is over. We analyze their resources, their waste that is currently costing them quite a bit of money to be uh, uh, yeah, transported. Um, what we do is we um, help them separate these uh, waste flows, um, support them in creating new products that they can sell on the market again and reduce uh, the, uh, the cost for our logistics and actually by selling new products we think we can in like three four years time uh, compared to the, the remaining cost. Actually yesterday the, the elderman um, of Rotterdam uh, opened the first sample of um, this uh, of the station we're developing we're now testing out uh, how different waste flows uh, the volume of them uh, how to treat them and um, when like by the end of this year we're currently collecting the funding to build um, a complete waste uh, or resource station as we call it where the resources are uh, collected monitored um, so, uh, selected and also uh, after entrepreneurs in the neighborhood transform them into products uh, can be sold again. And the whole thing collects water, uh, which also feeds the green roof. These are materials we're building it out uh, from like uh, um, uh, tabletops from bankrupt banks, uh, plus um, um, yeah, water tanks from the industry. And on the, the more public side of the market where there is a sports uh, uh, space, we also create a stage where people can uh, watch the sports. Okay, the last part of uh, this lecture, uh, we're looking at um, even larger scale that we're now investigating. I told you that we could start our super use in China, which led to a couple of commissions uh, for a project we would never uh, get if we uh, would work in the Netherlands. This is 150,000 square meter uh, intervention where after we started investigating industrial zones and trying to uh, create exchanges between industries, um, um, a development organization of the city of Guangzhou uh, um, asked us to design, actually redesign a um, uh, wastewater treatment plant which currently um, only uh, takes wastewater and turns it into uh, relatively clean water uh, and not much, uh, not much more. What we do is to actually uh, add all kinds of other program and activity <coughs> um, that um, benefits from uh, the wastewater byproducts, but also adds uh, new uh, flows 
uh, that connect it to the environment and actually uh, interact. So from the resources that we uh, see to exchange, we develop the, uh, a floor, uh, actually the, the, the volume of space we need and turn it into uh, what we see as the first chimneyless uh, factory site, which also of course includes uh, its own food production uh, and actually the exchange of the different um, resources of these companies is happening via the facade of this, uh, via of this inter intervention. Um, it's not just industry, but we like to mix uh, the visitor centers, uh, commercial functions with industry. And this is possible since industry is getting more clean uh, and um, yeah, miniature, uh, miniaturizing. Um, also, what we did in 2016 was even after one week of visiting, we found an investor for a, a Chinese uh, harvest map. Uh, of course, the volumes of materials we knew here in the Netherlands were 10,000 times uh, the ones we found in, uh, well, actually in China were 10,000 times the ones we could find in the Netherlands. Um, this project stalled because after a half year, the investor had another plan again and uh, shifted. So we're, uh, this one is on hold at the moment. Um, but in the Netherlands, we sold our harvest map to a, a demolishing company that is actually now upscaling this, uh, this to become really like the interface for uh, demolishing components and uh, construction industry. And this is really interesting um, way that since then we also started setting up a new collective, which is the Circular Design Collective. Um, so we're not scaling our company by growing a super use, but actually we connect with five other architecture firms that also grew in the past years um, have a, a structural engineer included and um, a software developer. And actually, as a collective now, we have over 200 uh, circular design uh, uh, professionals uh, collected together. And we're moving this forward also to exchange the knowledge and um, yeah, the tools that we have been developing on a project base in the last year. So uh, that's uh, how we are moving forward. Um, as a collective uh, and as super use. Well, that's where I want to leave it for today. I can imagine there may be some other uh, questions for now. Thank you. Thank you for the great lecture, Jan. Um, I have a question. Uh, so it seems like uh, some of your design, design decisions are informed by the um, the upcycling of the materials that you use. Um, do you sort of design with the um, larger scale of the building in mind, or do you um, first find the material and then sort of uh, design with the material already in mind, if that makes any sense? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. We, we started uh, in our more artistic uh, projects. So when we started 2012 Architects, we really uh looked at what kind of material do we have and then tried to develop our designs uh, from purely from that um currently it's a more parallel process so on the one hand uh, design the design and uh, of course the brief is influencing what we're what kind of materials we're looking for and on the other hand the materials we find inform our design and influence it and that's also why we developed um, a new type of contract, which is the definite uh, or the dynamic definite design, uh, which is different to what we always knew, which is a more static contract that when you complete your definite design, everything has to be, um, yeah, everything is forced into realizing the design as it has been defined by the architect. Uh, but we actually give some freedom in the process after this definite design to find other materials, adapt the design to uh, include these uh, materials and also include them in the final, uh, yeah, in, in the construction phase. So um, uh, that gives us a little bit of freedom in, um, in actually still having uh, the level of upcycling even higher after the, the design is uh, officially finished.
All right, just a reminder, if anybody has any questions, you can either submit it through the chat or I guess Yasmin, if you have a question, <laughs> if you want to ask yours. I mean, yeah, sure. Um, thank you for that um, lecture. It was really inspiring. And I think as like graduating students right now and like aspiring architects, um, I wonder how do you get um, students engaged in this process of like learning and discovering materials and you know starting to engage that like conversation at a like educational level like in our studio projects where we're used to like using concrete and looking at the steel manual and like you know these more typical materials mm. um, and also i like i'd like to to ask maybe how do you work across cultures where like the cultural aspect of like designing in rotterdam or in the netherlands um you know this whole like um community of you know like people you know actively recycling and partaking in that effort is very different to like designing let's say in the middle east or in china probably or in the us and so how do you start balancing and navigating it across those you know, you know like cultural differences um yeah i think it, it is indeed um, culturally dependent a little bit what we found was that actually in china there um people and entrepreneurs are are almost just or i think even more pragmatic than in the netherlands so whenever there's a, a new type of challenge which is a kind of a, a possibility uh we saw the chinese trying this and also they're not that strict in um uh, all the different uh, hierarchies so like for instance compared to japan there's a very strict hierarchy um i it, actually in Chinese entrepreneurship, this is uh, is different. So the, a lot of uh, changes are, and actually uh, experiments are possible also on a larger scale. We see. Um, next to this is that, of course, the, the government is uh, pushing towards sustainable development quite uh, quite a bit. Um, so that's that's happening. Um, uh, what is maybe unique for the Netherlands is is that. Uh, we have a kind of a, uh, uh, yeah, like the insurance for an architect is in a way that you're only uh, um, liable for a part. Uh, you have a shared liability with all the, the partners in a construction team, which allows for doing more experiments, we believe, than in many other countries. Like in, in Germany, for instance, already uh, the architect is, has the full liability for a complete project which means that they need to be much more risk aversive um, than uh, So I think that allows us to experiment. The only thing for the Netherlands is that's, I mean, apart from the size, but also the scale and is uh, rather small in which projects are uh, taken on. And also the Netherlands, uh, they like the innovation more than actually using the Dutch like Innovations maybe more than you trying to again copy it and using it in the next uh, uh, project again. So that um, is a little bit a limit to the uh, to scaling up, and that's why with the, the circular design collective, for instance, we're looking at can we actually standardize certain processes that we have developed so far on a project base and make them more, uh, uh, yeah, to actually include them into industrial production. And that, that might be really a next phase. And I, I think um, in that way, um, uh, this would also suit uh, the, uh, like an, an American environment as well more, where, which is uh, where um, development is looking at industrial scale as well. But you also had a first question, which I now forgot about. I mean, no, I was just wondering like what you would recommend we do as students. Oh, yeah. um, about the students, exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think um, the, the, we are very much a practice-based company. So everything we've developed is coming from like day-to-day uh, problems we encounter that we try to solve with a new tool or a new uh, yeah, innovation that we develop. Uh, also, it's about real materials that are available on a specific time. Um, yeah, maybe not after, which um, it makes it sometimes a little bit problematic to make this to transform this into an academic environment where 
um, yeah, you need to, um, where you don't have these strict um, um, circumstances, I would say, and that's, that's what we thrive in. But on the other hand, the tools um, that we develop, like the harvest map, for instance, indeed students can use the technique or the, the method to visualize uh, their resources. Um, um, I'm not sure about the status of the Harvest Map platform uh, at the moment. I think that's now down at the moment since we're redeveloping the whole uh, Harvest Map uh, for the Netherlands. Um, but uh, like this tool might be very uh, useful in an academic uh, way. But another thing we're now developing is um, um, also which we think could help uh, academics is where we uh, also uh, supply costs of materials to their, so their, their economic costs to their environmental costs. So we make a kind of a new tool for construction teams that uh, help them to discuss decisions there. And uh, we're also looking how we can into how we can we turn this into an educational tool. Uh, there's a question from Antonius in the chat. He asks, what challenges do you see for the USA to implement your ideas versus opportunities? What is the role for students and educational institutes in the USA? Um, yeah, I think uh, for the uh, US, I think like um, one of the things that, that we know is that um, like risks are uh, um, on a very high level in like in, in the early stages of a project so all the risks need to be predefined and already uh, uh, known and uh, taken care of and that's something that um, and of course not in every city and not in every environment but uh, something in general I think that makes it a little bit harder to work in this way because uh, you're working with components that so far have not been uh, certified for another use, for instance. Um, so I think uh, one thing for the US is, the, the, I think, cer certain certification of uh, uh, products or like we have now in the e EU, we have a kind of uh, EU certificate for the reuse of steel, even if you do not exactly know the the type or the, the, the brand of steel, um, you can actually have a, a certified application of it if you uh, make your calculations in the proper way. So this is something that will actually scale the, the use of uh, reclaimed steel uh, to a higher level. And I think these kind of um, methods and um, yeah, uh, support for larger industry are, are necessary in order to, to scale it up. Of course, first experiments can be done in order to learn from them. And then, uh, yeah, we're now working on a couple of potential projects uh, in the US where we can actually, um, yeah, that we hope we can uh, acquire to get them realized where we can actually test, uh, test this in the US. And that, that's, uh, that's what you see, every country has its own circumstances that you need to adapt to. And that's also why we didn't, uh, for instance, uh, grow our company Superuse and uh, are in charge of the Chinese one, but we have Chinese running the Chinese Superuse to understand the culture, to get back to your former questions of Yasmin to, um, yeah, to really understand that culture and adapt the Superuse method to the, to the local environment. Are there any final questions? Um, yeah, so I really love the idea of uh, upcycling and kind of reusing uh, materials. Um, I'm kind of, one of my main interests, I think, going into architecture has always been trying to find uh, new or easily uh, producible materials. So things like bamboo, or you mentioned uh, turning fruit into leather in sort of mm -hmm. ways. Uh, I've also read up on uh, turning like cactus into leather and such uh, kind of materials like that. So I was yeah. kind of curious on how you think the idea of recycling and kind of finding these new materials kind of intertwine. 
yeah, what we saw when we started at Subiu is that actually the recycling and um, um, yeah, the recycling industry was already growing quite fast and a lot of innovations were done on that basis. And we saw basically a, a gap in uh, innovations where you do not uh, grind uh, material uh, to its core base, but actually uh, also use all the efforts that already have been done and turn that into also uh, an aesthetic. And that's, I think, the continuous search we're doing as a company is how can you, on the one hand, uh, transform and adapt the material as little as possible, transport it as little as possible and create a completely new um, expression with it that maybe raises some eyebrows about why does it look like this, but um, um, also has a, a static, a cult, yeah, a statical cultural development in it. And so maybe we're trying to do that on the level of a building rather than on the level of a material. And which also, uh, yeah, this also uh, makes us much more limited, but uh, I think we we function better. The, the, the more limited uh, the frame is, we have to work in, the, the cr more creativity we get. Does anybody else have any questions? Thank, thank you, Jan. That was uh, really fantastic. And uh, I, I think you know, perhaps you're too modest to say it, but you part of the importance of doing what you're doing is to also turn it into good architecture. <laughs> uh, and I think that's a, a very important message to our students as well. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, thanks. It was a yeah, pleasure speaking here for a select audience <laughs> that's it absolutely i hope uh, this inspires and gives some ideas for because th that's what we feel i mean th th we are only at the uh, at the start of this new uh, development so th for the new generations there's still so much to uh, develop um, i think it's uh, yeah in that way a great uh, great future ahead still and uh, we will we will get you here for a further exposition. Uh, this lecture also was recorded, so uh, we will make it available to uh, to our students and our faculty here. So, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, John. Thank you.